Welcome to today's historic Roots Magic webinar. My name is Michael Booth, and I'm, I am Vice President of Roots Magic and one of its developers. And also with us this afternoon from a long voyage is the Roots Magician himself, Bruce Busby. And Bruce, of course, is the President of Roots Magic and its author. And the 1940 U.S. Census has been released, and tonight we'll look at how you can properly cite this great source for that family that you just found in it. And we'll look at an actual census page from Bruce's own family history and show you how to add a census event, create a census sort, and cite that source for the people in your Roots Magic file. And with that introduction, I'll turn the time over to Bruce. Hey, thanks for joining us. Okay, so today um, I'm going to try something a little bit different um, with this webinar, not just showing you an actual census uh, record and then how to cite it, but I'm actually going to try doing something uh, a little bit simple. In other words, show you how to cite a source, how to, how to easily do that. But then I'm going to show you a little bit of an advanced feature um, because it's a, it's a, there's a question that I know we get asked a lot when it comes to citing census records. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Now this is just a little simple file with the names of some family members. And this particular family, I've actually got a, uh, a census record in here. And so when I go and bring this up, here's an actual census record. Now I'm actually zoomed in. I can zoom back out a little bit so you can kind of see, see the whole page. So this is, this is a record from the 1940 U.S. Census. You can see right there. Uh, 16th Census of the United States, 1940. Now, this was actually just released uh, on April 2nd. Now, I had to actually find this particular record the hard way. Okay, California, this is a California uh, page. California isn't indexed yet. And so rather than try to explain to you how I found this page, I'll refer you to, uh, there's actually five webinars that we did with Dear Myrtle. Um, that I would refer you to to actually check out on how to how to actually find these census records based on uh, if you happen to know the address or the place uh, the neighborhood a person lived in back in 1940. Now, that being said, if you're if you're willing to be a little bit patient, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, um, the, most of these records will be indexed so that you can go to Family Search, for example and just type in type in a name and it will find them regardless of what state they're in. So rather than go through kind of how I found this, let's just let's just assume that I uh, magically it magically appeared for me. Now this I'm, I happen to be looking on on the family search website. You can also go to the National Archives. There's a number of different places that you can um, that you can actually view the these particular records. Okay, now this particular record, as you can see right here, uh, it's the United States Census, 1940, California, Fresno County, Judicial Township 13. This actually happens to be uh, the city of Layton uh, in Fresno County, but it happens to be just a little bit outside of the outside of the the city the city limits, and so that's why you're going to get this this Judicial Township. So this is going to be the record, and I'm going to go ahead and zoom back in a little bit. And I'm going to scroll back over here. And this right here is the family I'm looking for. Axel and Mina Sorensen, and Lawrence, Jimmy, and Marie, uh, the children. So I'm going to switch back to to my, my uh, Roots Magic screen. Now, this is where I will actually tell you that if you actually have the ability to set up two monitors, on your computer, it is well worth it because you're, what you're going to be seeing me doing is switching back and forth from screen to screen to screen. If you actually have two monitors, you can throw that census record over on that second monitor and work with Roots Magic on your on your main monitor. Uh, so just just throw that plug in about how nice that is to have that second monitor over there if that's if that's a possibility for you. So right now. What I basically have is just the family linkages. I just have Axel and Mina and then the children. I've kind of stripped out uh, some of this, some of the information. Um, 
you know, it, normally you would have other facts in there, but I've stripped that out for this particular for this particular webinar. Now, when you find a source, let's say we have this census record. Now, there's a number of different things I could do. I could go and add that census record as a source to the birth, to the occupation, to the residence, you know, to all of these individual facts if I wanted to. So that's one option. I would, I could go and click on the birth fact and then say, okay, I want to add a source to the birth fact and do that. I personally don't do that, so I'm going to show you how I actually do it. What I do is I go in and I create a new fact called census. Now, I use the individual census. You could use the family census, but I use the individual census, and I'll show you why in just a moment. So I'm going to add a new census fact. I'm going to select that, and it's added a census fact and put me up here. So I'm just going to do this simply. I'm just going to put 1940. Now, I could actually put the specific date, and I could come back here and edit that later if I want to. And the place, it's going to be Layton, Fresno, California, uh, USA, and I could, you know, I might want to change that to United States or, you know, however I want to do it. Um, and then I can go ahead and save that. Okay, so I have now created a census event. Now, if you look down here where you can customize the census, it'll say, Axel Sorensen appeared in the census in 1940 in Layton. If I scroll this down, you'll see that right there. Okay, so what I do is when I find a census record, I add a census event, and I add the census record as a source to that event. Like I say, I could add it to each piece of information, but as far as I'm concerned, if I have a census for this person or this family, if I use that as a as a source for the person's birth, it's not necessarily a great um, it's not necessarily a great source for that because it just says here's the person's age. And if you're like me, you've probably found a lot where the age is not even correct. Um, so in terms of being a source for the birth, it's kind of it can be kind of a so-so one. So for me, that census record or that census uh, source, I actually just add it to the census event. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, I got the census event, and I can add the source by either coming down here and clicking on the census sources button, since that, that's what's highlighted, and I'm working with the census here. Or as a shortcut, I can click right here in the source column for this particular event. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And Roots Magic brings up my citation manager. These are my census sources for Axel Sorensen. Now, what I want to do is I want to add a new source. I could use cite an existing source if I've already entered this, this particular census record. I haven't. So I'm going to go ahead and say I want to add a new source. And Roots Magic asks me what type of source that is that I want to, that I want to add. And there's about 500 different types of sources that are built in, although you can create your own. These are based on evidence explained. Now, the one I'm going to want is down here, Census U.S. Federal Online Image. Okay. Now, you'll notice it has a star next to it. That's because I happen to use this type of source a lot. So I have selected that source and clicked the little star, which made it, made it a, what's called a favorite. And I've done that with the different source types that I use a lot. So when I come to this screen, when I say I want to add a new source, instead of digging down through 200 or 400 or 500 different types of sources, I just click on Favorites. And there's the ones that I use a lot. And you can add as many as you want, or you can clear them. But this is the one I want, Census, U.S. Federal Online Images. Okay, I'm going to select that. And Roots Magic is going to bring up the screen where I can enter this particular source. Okay, now there's different tabs up here, and we'll cover, we'll cover those different tabs in this webinar. Um, but this first tab, this is for the citation. This is where I am going to create that footnote that prints at the bottom of my reports, or the end note that prints at the end of my reports. Um, it'll also create a bibliography, you know, if I want just a list of sources that were used someplace. But what you'll notice is since I actually selected a specific source type, I just have to fill in the blanks. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. The country in which the census was taken. Um, and you'll notice it says that it's optional. Now the reason for that is, you'll notice, as I type United States, the only place that this is used 
is in the bibliography. Now the bibliography is going to be just an alphabetical list of your sources and by doing it this way it allows your bibliography to sort by the country. Uh, it, just, it just helps it with sorting alphabetically, but it's not used in the footnote or the short footnote. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. The year and the type, okay, this is the 1940 U.S. Census, okay, and if, you, if you're not sure that that's what it is, uh, you can come in here and let's go ahead and scroll up here. Ugh. Okay, there we go. There's the 1940 U.S. Census. Okay, so that, that, we've got that right so far. Okay, the next question, the jurisdiction. Okay, and what it's going to ask for is the county and the state. And then you can also abbreviate it. That's what the little double bars mean, is when, you, when Roots Magic creates the footnote, it's going to use that same information in the short footnote, which the short footnote is what is going to get printed the second and third and fourth time uh, that you use that same this same source. Um, the short footnote lets you abbreviate things because the full place was in the ma in the master footnote uh, in the ma in the primary footnote. Now, if I don't put that abbreviation, the short footnote will just use the same thing as the footnote did. So let's go ahead and pop back to here, and I'm going to look at the jurisdiction. The jurisdiction is going to be the county is Fresno and the state is California. So let's go ahead and put Fresno County, California. And if I want to, I can put, and you'll notice over here that as I'm typing these in, it's writing the properly formatted footnote and short footnote for me. So right now it has Fresno County, California for both the footnote and the short footnote. But if I put those double, that double vertical bar in and type in Fresno CA, you'll notice that it uses the abbreviation for the short one. It's using the full one for the full footnote, but the short footnote, it's using that abbreviation. Okay, next question, what is the schedule? Okay, now let's go ahead and pop back to see what the schedule is. Um, or, and you can see right here, it is the population schedule. That's the one we want. So we're going to actually go ahead and enter population schedule. So basically, it's just filling in the blanks. It's look at the form, look at the image we have, and type the information in. What is the item type? Yeah, it's a di digital images, digital image. Okay, what's the website? Okay, in this case, the website is familysearch.org. Now, that, that website might be Ancestry. It might be, um, you know, NARA. It might be archives.com. It might be whatever. This is where you're going to tell... Uh, in this source where you happened to find it. Okay, the next item, the URL, the digital location. If I come back to here, right there, that's my URL, all that cryptic mess up there. So I can go click on that, select that, and then I can either right click and pick copy to copy that to the clipboard, or I can press Control C, and then I come back to here, and I'm going to paste that in, and I can right click and click paste, or I can do Control V, to paste that in. Okay, credit line, this is if you want to put something about the repository film details. I'm just going to go ahead and leave that blank for now. Um, but, uh, and you can, you can leave stuff blank or you can fill it in as you need. Okay, so I have now filled in everything necessary for the master source. Okay, now the master source means that's the part of the source of what I'm entering that I can reuse over and over and over again. So in other words, when I, when I finish with this particular source, you know, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to put in, you know, the enumeration district and more specific information. But if I ever want to use this, uh, if I ever find another image or another family in Fresno, California, 1940 U.S. Census, I can come and just reuse this master source. And I'll show you um, how, to, how to do that in just a bit. And I, there's another trick I'm going to show you. Um, uh, down the road in that second half. The thing that I said is maybe a little bit more advanced, uh, but, but it's something that a lot of people ask about. Okay, now I want to enter the information that is specific to this use. In other words, for this particular person in that 1940 census. So the next thing it's asking for 
is the civil division. And it's giving you an, uh, uh, an example. You know, sometimes it's wards or post offices or whatever. Well, if we move back to here, when we go over here, this is going to be your jurisdiction right here. And uh, you can actually see right here, that's basically Judicial Township 13. Okay, so I can actually put that, or I can I can put Layton. If I if I scroll this over right here, you'd see that it's actually Layton. But I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to put in Judicial Township 13 Layton. Okay, so you're just get, you're basically saying here is the more specific place. You know, I'm bringing it down to a more specific level. Okay, enumeration district. Okay, once again, we'll pop back to here. All you got to do is look around, and most of this information is up here on the top. So as I scroll over here, okay, um, and I need that scroll bar. I need that scroll bar to actually, ugh. Ah, okay. This is harder to do with this low resolution like this. The enumeration district is actually right here. And um, let me. I'm going to zoom. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So it's going it to. It's going to make it a little harder to see. Uh, let's do it this way. There we go. Okay, right there. And now I got to zoom in because we can't see this. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is your supervisor district. That's your SD, supervisor district number nine. But there is your enumeration district, ED number 10-142. So I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to put 10-142. There's my enumeration district. The page ID, okay, let's pop back over to there. And page ID is going to be this sheet number, 10B, like in boy. So I'm going to come back over here, and you're going to see it's actually giving you sheet, you know, whatever. And so I'm going to put sheet 10B. So as you can see, basically it's just look at the form and fill in the blanks. And as you're doing that, it's going to give you this properly formatted source. So let's pop back over. We're looking for the household ID. Now when I come back over to here, and I'm going to go look at that family we were looking at right here. This is the household ID right there. As the enumerator goes from house to house, each new house he comes to, he increases that number. It puts in the next number. So the household ID for Axel Sorensen is 191. So I'm going to pop back over there, and I'm going to enter, you know, family 191 or household 191 or whatever you want to call it. Okay, next one, the person of interest. Now this, you could actually do a couple of things. I could put just Axel Sorensen, or I could put Axel Sorensen household, or whatever I want. But this is where I'm putting who this I'm using, actually using this source for. Okay, go on to the next one. How did I access this? Did I access it? Did I view it? Did I download it? You know, you can put whatever you want. I'm going to actually put downloaded, because I've actually previously downloaded this to show you kind of what I'm going to do. And the date I accessed this, and today is May 17th, 2012, and there we are. We now have a properly formatted footnote, short footnote, and bibliography for this particular, this particular source. Okay, so let's go ahead and before I move on, well actually, let's go ahead and I'm gonna move, I'm gonna go ahead and click right here. I'm gonna click OK down here, and because I want to actually save this. I'm going to come back to those other tabs. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to save it and come back. You could actually start right in on those other tabs if you wanted. Now, what, what Roots Magic's asking is to provide a name for this source, in other words, for this master source, so that I can reuse it. So I'm going to type in something like census um, US 1940 California Fresno County. Now, you can enter whatever you want. Uh, you can put something completely random in here. The only place that what you've typed in here is used for is when Roots Magic brings up your master source list of all the sources you've already entered. 
this is what it's going to use to sort them. It's going to be an alphabetical list based on this. So by entering it like this, it's going to group all my census records together. It's going to group within that all the U.S. Census, within that all my 1940 Census, within that all my California 1940 Census, and then it's going to alphabetically list by county. Now, if, if I wanted to uh, have my list sort geographically, I might have put census, comma, California, comma, Fresno County, comma, 1940. But it's up to you, and you can change this anytime you want. This is just asking initially what it is. I'm going to click OK, and there's my source. So here is my master source, and these are those, those details for this particular source. Now, I'm going to go right back in and edit this again. So I'm, I'm, right, I'm right back in where I wanted. And as I, as I mentioned, here's that master source name. As I mentioned, you can come change that whenever you want, so it's right there. Okay. Mass, let's let's move ahead on to some of these other uh, to some of these other tabs right here. Okay, I am going to uh, kind of go through some a couple of these quickly because I don't really use them that much. One of these is the master text. Okay, this is going to be text that or comments that refer to the source as a whole. Now, for a census, I honestly don't even really use this. If this happened to have been a book, um, your source text. Uh, or your source comments might be text about the, um, you know, the introduction to the book or comments about, you know, what kind of shape the book was in, things like that. What's more important is this detailed text. So let's go ahead and move to that. The detailed text, this is going to be specific to this use of that source. In other words, how this particular source is being used for this particular family. And the first part of that's going to be your research notes. And this is going to be where you actually extract out or transcribe what's in that source. So this might be where I put in something like um, Axel Sorensen. And it may, let's go ahead and pop back to, back to this. Okay, I've got Axel Sorensen, and he was listed as the head, and he's male, white. Okay, so I'm going to come back in here, and I can put... Um, Head, male, white, um, you know, let's go look and see what else there is. Um, 51, um, you know, and, and uh, born in Denmark. So I might come in here and put, he was 51, he was born in Denmark. And then I may also go in and, you know, there may also be uh, what his, what his um, occupation was. He was a farmer, okay? So... We're going to come back in here, and he was a farmer. Now, I could also do Mina Sorensen, and she was listed as the wife, female, white. Uh, I don't remember what her age was at the time. Her age was 43, Nebraska, and she's a cook. So I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to put she was 43, Nebraska, cook. And I could continue this for each of the children. So in other words, what I'm doing is I'm just actually extracting out uh, whatever information from this source that I actually want. If this happened to have been a book, I might have just written uh, a verbatim what the paragraph or the sentence talking about this person's, you know, this person's event was. Comments. This is where I can actually comment on what I've extracted. So if there's information in here that, that doesn't necessarily agree with other sources I have, I may go ahead and put my comments to analyze why, you know, why I think this may have differed or just comment that, you know, this seems to differ from what I've already got. Okay, so that is your detail text, and that's what you're going to use that for. Let's go ahead and go on to media. Media is where I can actually add an image. And as I mentioned, I've already downloaded that particular image so I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to say I want to add new media, and it's going to be an image, and I've already scanned it, so it's on, my, it's on my disk. I don't need to scan it. It's actually just downloaded, so I'm going to click Disk, and this is the image right there. So I'm going to go ahead and select that and open that, and Roots Magic is going to bring up that image. I now have that, and I can give it a caption. I can put um, U.S. Uh, 1940 Census. Um, California, Layton, whatever. And I can put a description in there and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. 
Now, you'll notice, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but you'll notice that this, now that this is highlighted, over here in the tags, it's automatically added a tag. It's tagged this particular citation with, tagged that image with the citation. Now, this is what gets really cool with the new tagging, media tagging in Roots Magic 5. I can now go in and say I want to tag the media with other stuff. So I'm going to go tag it with a person, and I'm going to select it. I'm going to pick Axel, and I can put a comment in here. In other words, any comment about him appearing in this census. So I've added him. I can go tag another person, and that person, you know, I might pick Mina and so on. And, of course, I could continue to do this with each of the children. What's nice is I can, I can actually just look at this image, and I can see everybody that I need to tag. So I don't have to go into Axel's and Mina's and each of those children to add this media, this, this census image to their, to their individual media albums. I can actually just look at the album and tag them from right there. So right now I have the citation and the people I can go into Tag Media, and I can say I want to tag the family. Which family? Okay, I only have that one family. So they are now tagged in that as well. I can also go in and say I want to tag a place. And the place I want happens to be um, Leighton, Fresno, California, because that's where it was. Okay, so I can go in and tag this image of this census record with the people that are in it, the families that are in it, the citation. Uh, that use this particular image and the place that it actually refers to. Okay, so I've, got, I've done that. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move on to the next tab. I'm going to go to quality. In Roots Magic, when you enter a quality, you're basically saying, here is how good this particular source is for what I'm using it for. Okay, it's not a simple drop list that says it's good or bad, good, bad, or ugly. It actually follows the BCG uh, board. Uh, for certification of genealogists, uh, standard for how to analyze how good a source is for a particular piece of information. Okay, so there's three parts to this, and we give you the little definitions for what, what they mean. The source, okay, is this source in its first recorded form, is it a, der a derivative? Well, I was actually looking at an image of the handwritten thing, so this is an original, okay? Original, if, if I actually was looking at the piece of paper, yes, that's original. But if I'm looking at a photocopy like this of that original, that's also an original because you're looking at the initial first recorded form. If, on the other hand, I was taking this information for the citation and everything from an index, in other words, if I had gone on to Family Search or Ancestry and typed in a person's name and it came up with, a list of information that said, oh, this person was in such and such census, and you based it on that list of text, that's a derivative because that's been extracted, transcribed, indexed. When you're looking at an index, that's a derivative. But once I move from that index and look at the actual copy of the image, then that's going to be original. Okay. The next piece of information uh, that, that I need to, to analyze is what about the information? Now, was this, is it primary or was it secondary? In other words, did the person who provided this information have first-hand knowledge of this, or was it second-hand knowledge of this? Okay, now, I'm going to come back to the, I'm going to come back to this census image, because I want to, I want to show you something here. Um, you'll notice that Axel, right here, has a little circle with an X next to his name. There's a number of people here in each family that have a circle with an X next to their name. What that means is that is the person that actually talked to the enumerator. Okay, so I can look at this and I can see that Axel's the one who actually provided this information. Okay, so I can assume he's probably got a pretty good idea of, of, of when and where various people were born. Now, sometimes you may assume that the wife actually knows more about the family than the husband, and, you know, that may or may not be true. Um, but you can use you can use that little circle with the X to to help you decide whether or not you think that this would be primary or secondary information. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say in this case it was primary. The husband and the family actually provided it. Okay, the last item is your evidence. Okay, and your evidence is going to be 
does this source actually answer that, that the research question by itself? Now, in this case, I'm using the census source, the census record, um, as a source for the census event. So yeah, that's pretty direct. It, this actually shows that that person appeared in the census, so that's direct. On the other hand, if I was using this federal census image, if I was using this image right here um, to as a source for his birth, then that's going to be indirect because it says he was 51. So I could actually say, well, this is in 1940, and it says he's 51 years old, so I can kind of guess about when that would make his birth. And I may have his birth date from another source, but this is only going to be indirect evidence. Okay, this is, this is only going to be indirect evidence if I'm using this census record for his birth. But since, like I say, since I'm using it for the census, I'm going to go ahead and say it's direct. Okay, finally, the repository. This is where you can actually go ahead and choose where this record is. So, you know, you might go ahead, go in here and uh, edit, edit an address and create a repository um, for called Family Search and say that's where this happens to be. I'm not going to spend time doing that. You can just click at edit address, um, enter Family Search as a repository, and in the future you just reselect Family Search each time. Okay, so that that right there is kind of an overall view of how to add a census event to the person and to add a source and show the quality, add the image, and all of that for that source. Okay, and right here, there's my research notes, so I can see, see that down here as I highlight different sources that I'm using, different citations, I can see all the details down here. Okay, I want to close out here. Okay, step two. Okay, what I've done so far is I've added a census event to Axel, to the head of the household, and I've added a census source, and I've added uh, the image, and I've tagged the various people that are in it, and so on. Um, but what I want to do now is I want this information to be available for the other family members. Okay, so if I select Axel, if I go in, I see his census information. But if I go into his wife, I don't see anything about her being in the census, although if I did click on her media album, I would see that in there, but I don't see that as an event. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, and I'm going to select this census event that I just added, and I am going to share this census event. Okay, and what that means is I want to share this fact that I just added with other people in the file. I don't want to have to go to Mina and go through all of this and add all this again. So I'm going to say I want to share it, and I'm going to say I want to add a person. That's who I want to share it with. I'm going to add a person, choose them from the database, and I'm going to pick Mina. Okay, and so now I'm sharing this census event with Mina. And now I can select what is her role. And I'm going to say her role, it isn't a witness. I'm going to add a new role type. And her role is wife. Okay, and, and that's what it actually said, you know, in the, in the census record. If you remember when I actually went to the census and showed it right there, she is listed as wife. Okay, so I'm going to list her as a wife. Now, since I'm creating this new role type, I can create a sentence template for this role, and that's way beyond what we can cover in this particular webinar. We are working on a webinar where we're going to show you how to do sentence templates. Um, but it, it, if you want to get started with this for now, I would recommend going, if you go and look in the help file or in the Roots Magic book, um, there's an entire sections on the sentence template language for actually doing this. But, you know, it would, it would actually look something like um, this person appeared um, as a, um, appeared as a spouse in the household of person, um, you know, and so on. And you can put what, you can, you can use date and place and all of that type of thing. Uh, like I say, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. I'm going to go ahead and click OK, and I've added uh, and shared this with the wife. Now I'm going to go in and say I want to choose a couple of other people, and I'm going to go ahead and pick, uh, let's go ahead and pick James Sorensen, and he was not a witness. He wasn't a wife. I could add a new role type. Now in this role type, I could actually use, um, I could actually put child, 
which is actually what I do. Or you could do one for son and one for daughter. It's up to you, whichever you want. Um, sometimes doing son and daughter make it easier to do the sentence template because you don't have to worry about using um, the, the gender modifiers. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say child. And I've added James as a child. And I could go do the same thing for the others. I could go ahead and do Lawrence. And once I've added a ch that as a role type, it's there. I don't have to keep creating it each time. So I'm going to add a, another child. And let's go ahead and add the last one, Marie. And she was a child. And I've basically now shared it with those people. Now I see a question up here that I'm going to go ahead and answer right now rather than kind of hold off. And that is um, about using the census family um, event. Why, why not use a, the family census event rather than doing this? The reason for that is family events really are, should be thought of more as couple events. In other words, you know, husband, wife, whatever. Because those are really for things like marriage, uh, engagement, divorce, things between a couple. It is, it's that when you add a family type event, a family residence, a family census, you're actually add, attaching it to the family record um, and not the individual records. Now, one reason you wouldn't want to do that is because if you've got a family with 10 children, you may only have five of those children that were alive when this census was taken. Well, you don't want to use a family census event because that's going to kind of assume that, that, that all 10 of those children were in there. By doing this, I can go and say add a person. I can only share it with just the, the children that actually happen to be showing uh, in that census event now, or in that census record. Now, the other reason to do it this way is because not every household is only dad, mom, and children. Sometimes you have nieces and nephews and uncles and grandparents and boarders uh, living in that household. Well, by doing the, the census for the head of the household, you can then go and use this shared fact to actually share this fact, not with, just with wife and kids, but you can share it with other family members, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the nieces and nephews, even boarders that happen to be uh, listed in that census. So there, there, that's the reason. I personally never used the family census event. We actually added the census, the family census event, because GEDCOM has it in there, and so we needed to support it. But I personally never use it. I only use the personal individual census and then share it with the other people. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to say OK. And now, when this is highlighted for Axel, you'll say, see four other people are sharing this census, this census fact. So when I come out of here, if I go into Mina, OK, I didn't add a census event to her, but it is now showing. And that's what this little green symbol with the arrows means, is that this is actually shared from somebody else. I actually added that fact to somebody else. They're the principal person. And this is, a, um, is, is the person who it is shared with. Okay, now, but what's great about this, though, is if I click on this, if I realize that I entered something wrong, like if I realized, oh, this is actually the 1930 census, I can actually change it right from here. I can change it from Mina's screen, and it's going to change not just for her, but it's going to change for Axel and the three children that I added it to. Same thing with the, with the sources. If I go in here and edit this source, and I come in and I edit that, and I uh, come in and extract more information out. As I extract more information out right here, when I come back to Mina or, or Axel or any of the kids, that's actually going to have been updated for them as well. OK, so what we've done so far is we've shown you how you can go in and add a census event and then add a source, uh, taking the information directly, directly from that census record, and cite it, uh, put your image in, tag the images, and then share that event with other people. OK, now I'm actually going to switch gears for just a second. And we're going to go into something that, that you, don't have to, you don't have to know how to do, but we do get questions. OK, I'm going to come right back into. I'm going to go back into this, into this uh, source. 
and I'm going to edit this, and I'm going to go end it here. One of the common questions we get is a lot of people don't want to have a separate master source for each jurisdiction. Okay, some people want a single master source. There, there's a terminology. There's something called lumpers versus splitters. You know, lumpers want one source that covers everything, and splitters want to have stuff down to a much more specific level. Okay, if you want to be able to enter a one master source that's basically just, you know, it would have the country, the year and the type. Um, most likely you'd have the population schedule because that's what you're going to be working with most of the time. It's almost always a digital image. You're probably going to always use the same website. Um, so if, let's say, you would prefer, though, that this jurisdiction, in other words, the county and this, uh, this URL, this specific thing, Let's say you actually wanted those down in the source details rather than the master source. I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay. And now you may actually prefer to, you know, there's another option, and that is you might not mind having the jurisdiction up here, but you might want that URL down in the source details because Fresno counties may be in, may be in 30 different, and it actually is, it's in 32 different images. So you actually may prefer to have that URL down in the source details. So I'm going to show you how you can actually make your own source template to handle that situation. And like I say, this is not something that you know every everybody needs to worry. If 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 using it the way I've shown you works for you, then then you don't even have to pay attention during this next little segment. But um, you know, for those who want to know how to do this, we're going to show you how. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into list, and then I'm going to go down here into the source templates. Okay, this is a this is where I can actually look at all the hardcore gory details about how each one of these source templates looks. So if I scroll down here, I'm going to come down here to this one right there. That's the one, the U.S. Federal Online Images. Okay, now if I try to edit this. It's going to tell me I can't do that. You cannot edit the built-in source templates. These source templates are based on evidence explained, and so we don't actually allow you to go in there and, and deviate from them. But what you can do is you can highlight it, and you can say, I want to make a copy of that. Say yes, and now I have my original one, which I can't edit, and I have this one, which says copy, which I can edit. And when I click on edit, it's going to bring me up a screen, and I can edit this to my heart's content. So the first thing I might want to do is, um, is change this. Instead of just saying copy, I could say my better version, you know, or I could, if I wanted it to show up at the top of the list, you know, I could put some special character, you know, an underline or something that sends it all the way to the top of that master source template list. Okay, so you can you can do that right there. Now, in this case, and we you know I'm not I'm not going to get too technical here. These templates you don't need to touch them. Okay, these will work exactly the same regardless of whether you put a field in the master source or down in the source details. So you don't even have to worry about messing with these. Okay, they're they're kind of they're kind of programmy looking. You know, if you want to, you can. You know, if you want to go in and see how the how the source template language works, you can go in there and you can tweak this out to your heart's content as well. But what they, what you're going to have on this side is these are all of those pieces of information Roots Magic was asking for. If you remember, it asked for the country and the year and the type and the jurisdiction and the schedule, and then it had uh, some other things. The only thing you really need to change in here is this part, and that's whether or not something is part of the master source of the details. So one of the things we talked about was we wanted to move jurisdiction down into the details. So I'm going to edit this field. I don't need to change the field name or what's displayed or the hint. Maybe if you want a better hint, you want a hint that's more detail or you actually want to come in here and create some longer hint, you can do that as well. But the only thing you really need to change is you want to say jurisdiction, 
is a source detail field. Just check that. That's all you have to do. Same thing with the URL. You wanted to make the URL um, a source detail. You come down and you say it's a source detail field. And I'm going to go ahead and click that. And you'll notice that it put the little X saying those are source details. Okay. That's all I'm going to do. That's all I really want to spend my time on. I'm going to go ahead and click close. Now, if I go back in here, okay, let's say I want to add a, I'm just, I'm just going to come back in here to the source citation. I'm going to come back into the same ones. This source is still, is still a U.S. A US federal sim, sim, uh, census online images. Um, it's, 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 it's the bit one that's built in, so there's not really much I can do to do that. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to say I want to add a new source, and when I add the new source, when I come down here, there's the one that was built in, and here's the new one I created. I made a copy. This is my better version. And I could have changed the description right here as well, but I'm going to ch choose my better version. I'm going to click OK, and what you'll notice is everything is exactly the same except jurisdiction and the URL are now part of the source details. So if I fill this out exactly the same as I did before, United States, 1940 U.S. Census, population schedule, um, image, or digital image, title of the website. Like I say, if, you, um, if you're always getting them all from the same spot, you can go ahead and put that in. Um, if not, if, you're, if you actually go to different websites for your images, you may have wanted to have moved website down in here to the source details as well. Okay, and now here's where we can put Fresno County, California, and the civil division. You know, I can I can put I can put the various information there, including that URL, access type, and the access date, 5-17-2012. Okay, I can go ahead and do that. This source looks exactly the same as the other source. It looks exactly the same as the Census U.S. Federal. The only difference is that when I reuse this, I'm not having to have a master source for Fresno County, for Los Angeles County, for um, you know Santa Clara County. I don't have a separate one. I would just have a single that one of those. So when I click OK and it asks for the master source name, I'm going to put in Census U.S. 1940. I don't have to put in those specifics. Go ahead and click OK. And so now my source is going to have this information and my details now have all of that specific. Okay. So here's, here's, where it's, here's where it's going to be a little bit different. Okay. When I say cite an existing source, if I choose the one that's built in, okay, Fresno County, when I select that, it already has all of that built in and I just have to put in this information. Okay, it's already set up for Fresno County. On the other hand, if I say cite an existing source and choose the generic one, the one I created using my better version, I now am basically using this for just the U.S. Census, so I actually have to put the county in the source details, and so I do have to do that each time. So it's a trade-off, um, you know, which way you want to do it. The, the, the nice thing is Roots Magic does give you the flexibility. It's going to give you the ability to, you know, you're not necessarily tied to the source templates that we, you know, it's, it, we're not forcing you to have, to have to live with the ones we created. You can create your own custom, uh, your own custom source templates and tweak them uh, as much as you wanted to. Okay, a couple of questions that I've seen. Um, when, when we release Roots Magic updates, uh, are your customized templates kept? Yes, they are. Your, your, when you create these customized templates, uh, those are actually stored in your database. Um, so when, when it updates the database, your custom source templates uh, are, are, are retained um, in that file. Um, how is the census shown on a family group sheet? Yeah, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and show that. I'm going to come in. I'm going to select this family. We're going to go into a family group sheet. I'm going to go into Forms and choose a family group sheet. And it's going to be different depending on how you set your sources up. So if I go into the sources and I say I don't want any, any footnotes, okay, 
it's going to come up looking like this. There's going to be no sources at all. On the other hand, if I come in and I say I want end notes at the end of the document and generate it, I'm going to have the little footnote numbers. You'll see right there, one, two, one, two, and so on. And at the end, there are my end notes. Okay, and they are going to show up as my long version and my short version. If I if I was these are actually I actually added the, those two different types, so you're going to see the long version of each of those. But if 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 each one of these people was using that, I would actually have the, the long version and the short version in there. Okay, the next option, and I usually don't do this with family group sheets because sometimes it can kind of weird out on you. If I say I want footnotes at the bottom of each page, that's going to give me the family group sheet, and then it's going to have the sources. Um, the, the biggest problem with, with footnotes is you do get a lot of duplication uh, because at, at end notes, the program can take advantage of the fact that those sources are all over, um, and so it can kind of kind of clean up your 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 list of your sources. Footnotes, like I say, can kind of um, can kind of do some do some strange things at times. The other thing under sources is the bibliography tab, and uh, if I tell it to print a bibliography, and I can have footnotes, end notes and a bibliography. So I can do end notes and a bibliography. And if I do that, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have my end notes. There's my end notes where it lists each of the sources tied numerically back up to the data. And then my bibliography is going to be my alphabetical list of the sources that were in this report. And it doesn't matter whether it's a family group sheet or a narrative. Um, it's going to be your alphabetical list where each source is only listed one time. Okay, um, how do you key the two vertical lines for abbreviations? Um, they are right above the backslash. So on your keyboard, if you find your backslash, it, 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 you do shift backslash, and it's going to do the little vertical bar, and you do the two little vertical bars right there. Um, well, will, the, will shared events transfer through GEDCOM? Yes, they will. Um, well, they will from Roots Magic to Roots Magic. Um, most other programs don't have shared events. Uh, so Roots Magic puts the shared events into the GEDCOM file. And so if you export a GEDCOM and somebody with Roots Magic imports it, yes, the shared events come over. If somebody with a different program uh, imports that GEDCOM, no, the shared events don't come over because they don't, they don't support uh, shared events. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Uh, hopefully, uh, we were able to kind of give you a, a little bit of kickstart on how to use source templates and sources in general uh, to actually, you know, do the fill in the blank, uh, do your details, you know, to extract your your um, research notes to actually extract out that information. Uh, how to use the images to add images to your sources and then tag the various uh, people and families and places that are also in that in that source. Um, or in that image, and and then also how to uh, do some minor tweaking of source templates if you want to create one. Um, like I said, down the road we will be doing a webinar just on sentence templates and short source templates where we'll go into uh, more detail on how to do that. But in the meantime, uh, check out the online help in Roots Magic. It's got a full uh, a full uh, big section on. Uh, on the source template language. So again, uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.